Hello, I'm Ian Scales, you're watching Telecom TV, and we're here at Smart IoT London, where I'm going to be talking to William Webb. William is the CEO of Weightless, and he also sits on several Ofcom committees. So um, we want to talk about openness and IoT. William, welcome. Thank you, Ian. Um, as I just said, I would really like to talk to us to talk about open source and open standards, and yeah. I know you're, it's a subject that's very close to your heart because we've spoken about it several times Absolutely. before. So my observation, just to kick this mm. off, is that in every other part of the telecom industry at the moment, it's underpinned almost, or people are aiming to have it underpinned, by open source code at the very yeah. least, yeah. and but definitely open standards at the, at the very most. Absolutely. In IoT, I don't see that happening so much. Of course, there are people that are wanting to do that, yeah. but we haven't seen m many green shoots yet. No. What's your, could you observe on that, please? <laughs> so you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's a real mess right now in the internet of things. So we have three different areas, I suppose, you could focus on. One is in-home or short area. To some degree, that is one where there are standards such as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, but they're not standards designed for the internet of things. They're standards that are just being pre-purposed, repurposed for other things. But that's not the area I think that's of most interest. We're looking mostly at the, the wider area of connectivity that's more suitable for smart cities, asset tracking, all those kind of things. And that falls into an unlicensed set of technologies and standards and a licensed set. The licensed set actually is evolving around standards because it's being developed through 3GPP, the body that develops the cellular standards. And whilst they've got many variants, they're gradually finding their way towards a single solution. But in the unlicensed world, we have four or five different contenders of which all apart from Waitlist, the body I represent, are closed in some way, shape or form. They're either completely proprietary or, or they have bits that are open such as the terminal side, but bits that are closed such as the base station side. And I think that, that leads to no end of problems, but the biggest problem is what I sometimes characterize as the, the washing machine problem, which is if you were a Chinese manufacturer, you were making a washing machine, you decided you wanted to connect your washing machine because that offered, allowed you to offer some kind of new feature that was of interest to people who were buying it, remote maintenance or whatever it might be. What chip would you put into that washing machine? Would you put in Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 2G, 3G, 4G, Sigfox, LoRa, Waitlist, Ingenue, all of the above in the hope that one of them connects? And because you can't do all the above, it's too expensive. And because you don't want to pick the wrong one because that saddles your washing machine with both extra cost and you get an annoyed consumer because it doesn't connect, you do nothing. Yeah. And that's the problem we've got at the moment. People are doing nothing, except in areas that are fairly closed and where it's really critical they move ahead, in which case they can pick one particular technology and control that system. But that's not very many areas. And that's why the Internet of Things is not yet exploding in the way that so many had predicted that it would happen five, or five years ago or so. So we're still wheel spinning, as it were, because we're waiting for one yeah. scalable technology to come through. I think so, and if you, if you look at, say, wearables, that didn't have that problem. So if you were going to make a wearable, you had no debate over what connectivity chip you put in. It was going to be Bluetooth, because everyone's got a mobile phone, and every mobile phone's got Bluetooth. So now, we still don't quite know what wearables are for, but the connectivity side of it wasn't the blocking problem. Yeah. But in the Internet of Things, it very much is. And what history tells us is that in any particular area of wireless connectivity, we get one winning standard, Bluetooth for personal area, Wi-Fi for local area, cellular for wide area, and so on. And it's only one, and it's an open standard. So the Internet of Things, I don't see as being any different in its dynamics from any of those areas. So it seems to me that we will inevitably, sooner or later, end up with an open standard and probably one or at most two, perhaps one for licensed, one for unlicensed, that will emerge from this melee and morass of different competing activities that are going on at the moment. Except that, you know, when I talk to other people, they talk about the really important things in IoT being applications. Mm -hmm. Now the point is that those applications are very diverse. Yes. Some demand very low power, long life batteries. Yeah. Some don't worry about that much yeah. at all. Some demand you know, very long range. Yeah. Now, to a certain extent, the standards that we've got at the moment, the LoRa and the Sigfox and so on, <clears throat> they tap different mm. elements of those, mm. of those. So you have a range of horses for various courses. Yeah. Um, what do you say to that? I mean, a, l a lot of other people would say that we can't compress all of those standards into one big Uber standard 
because the market wouldn't bear it. So there's certainly truth in that, the applications are varied. But the problem is if we end up with too many different standards, it's unlikely there'll be that many networks deployed. So if we decided we needed four different standards, let's say for different balances of range and cost and so on, then we'd need four different networks deployed across the country. And the, and the, the amount of revenue in the business is probably not sufficient for that. So I don't see how we can achieve that. I think what we'll end up with is one technology and that will be well suited to, to some applications, less so to others. And I think those other applications will, will have to learn to live with that and adjust their demand to that. And in the same way, we only have one cellular technology we're all heading towards, despite the fact that some people want to download many gigabytes and do streaming video and others only want to make emergency calls. But we don't have different technologies for those because it would just be too expensive to run separate networks for them. So that would be, you know, the ideal solution often doesn't happen. And what does tend to happen is people change their application. So you might say, actually, my application requires lots of streaming video. And then I'll come along and say, well, that's fine. But the solution I've got doesn't really allow you to do that. And if you did want to do it, it would cost you $500 a month. And you might then say, actually, perhaps I don't need streaming video. Perhaps I can make do with storing video locally and then just sending a few frames of the video sequence that you particularly want to see when some alarm was triggered or something yes. like that. OK. Well, that could be the case, of course. I don't know. You can always argue around the metaphor itself, can't yeah. you? Yeah. And um, I resist the temptation to do that. But on the other hand, there might be a way in which you can amalgamate all of those qualities into a single standard mm. where you could cherry pick different aspects of it. So yeah. you'd have a one, one standard fits all, but you can configure the remote device to perhaps better hu husband its power um, depending upon how far away it is from, you know, there might be ways yes. of melding them together. I think Do you that, see that as a possibility? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, that uh, chipsets are becoming ever more capable. We can have a standard with multiple different variations within it. And we see that with Wi-Fi, for we example. See that with so wi -Fi. You can have and with cellular to yeah, a certain extent. Exactly. So you can just pick 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, or you can have combined 2.4 and 5. You can decide to aggregate multiple channels together to get very high data rates, or you can just have the simple solution. Yes. And so different chipsets can have different elements and pick and choose of that. That that I suspect is quite likely in the Internet of Things. So so yes, it's a fair point. We may well see a number of these technologies being squeezed into one standard which itself has a number of variants within that and as long as that doesn't add too much cost and complexity to the chipset then the manufacturer of a particular device then says well my device would only turn on part b of that standard because it doesn't need the rest yeah. of it and that can just s sat yes. there quiescent on the chipset that's what pure economics would apply to that mm. you know the minute it gets cheap enough to do that they'll be able to do it yeah you mentioned wi-fi which is an interesting case mm. because of course the other you know the other, the other party might yes. say we can we can use Wi-Fi and we can adapt that sim very similarly yeah. to what you're talking about with Halo, for instance, which is their yeah. standard for low-powered Wi-Fi. Yeah. <clears throat> how how likely is it? Do you think the Wi-Fi will sustain? I mean, it's one of those technologies, mm. isn't it, that just keeps you know morphing into something yes. slightly <laughs> different. It does, and it's done a fantastic job of developing and enhancing itself over the years to the extent that actually it's probably the, the one we use more than anything else now. We might think that actually we use cellular and then move over to Wi-Fi, but actually it's the other way around. Most of our devices only have Wi-Fi, actually, if you look at them. So, so you're quite right. So could Wi-Fi take over? I think it might do in the home. And the reason it might well do there is because we already have Wi-Fi in the home. So it's easy to bring devices in and just connect them up to the existing Wi-Fi router at the moment. The battery life's not fantastic, but you can imagine that evolving over time and gradually getting better. Would it extend to a wide area coverage? I think that's too much of an ask for Wi-Fi. So you know, the current standards are talking about extending the range from 100 metres to a kilometre. But actually, to get cost-effective coverage of a country, one kilometre range is not sufficient. You need to be at about four or five kilometres, was the modelling that we showed for the UK, for example, gave you the ability to, to cover the whole country with a decent number of base stations. And Wi-Fi can't leap too far off into any particular direction because it needs to maintain backward compatibility with everything else that's mm -hmm. out there. And so that does constrain its, its direction. So I don't think it will be the solution for the wider area. Right, okay. But it certainly 
looks like being the de facto solution for the for the in-home area. I if think you're so. Full supported. Yeah. The only other thing we see coming along is people like Hive and so on are deploying their own hubs in 868 megahertz or similar to that. But those aren't really standard. So those are just each individual application saying, here's my hub. And that's a bit of a pain, frankly, as a consumer, you don't really want to end up with this massive hubs scattered around your home, all eventually probably interfering with each other when yeah. it gets to the stage that's that right. the spectrum constraints are such that they can no longer operate effectively. That's right. These, these friendly home hub um, yeah. schemes look like becoming more and more complicated, don't they? They do. When I read yeah. them up. Yeah. What about, um, you talked about the GSMA standards before and yeah. the cellular standards and so yeah. on. Now, if we follow through on what you were talking about, about the necessity for the to be a very limited number of standards mm. that everybody can support, mm. um, obviously in the hot seat are going to be the GSMA wide, wide area yeah. standards. How likely is it that they will be open in the way that you suggest? In other words, mm. could, they be easy, could they be open enough to be supported in unlicensed bands as well? Now I know that you know the waitlist yeah. thing, the Newell thing before, yeah. that's exactly how they were going to do it. They were going yeah. to do it in the unlicensed spectrum first and yeah. then the same technology was going to be suborned within the cellular um, environment yeah. under GSMA. Yeah. What, wh from your mm. doing this in 5G, how likely mm. do you think it is that that scenario that you were talking about before mm. was going to take place? Yeah, so at the moment the, the mobile operators and that whole 3GPP community is focused on licensed spectrum and actually on something that s is very close in its look and feel to 4G so that it can be ideally software downloaded to the operator's base stations and running that. And that means the route they've gone down is not particularly well suited to unlicensed, which has very different regulatory environment, typically lower power, different bandwidths, and also this whole issue of not knowing whether you're going to get interference, so you need to design around that. So where they're at at the moment is not particularly well suited for that, and, and that's fine, they, they wasn't intended to. Could they add that mode on? Possibly, but they're I think they're going to be spending quite some time delivering on the license side of things. They still haven't finished those standards. They're quite complex. And when they finish them, they've got to test them, certify them, build the chipsets and so on. I think by the time they've done that, there'll already be some kind of a de facto solution non-licensed. And it'll be far easier for the mobile operators just to say, well, we'll if we want to use a mix of the two, we'll flip between those two. So in the same way that they use Wi-Fi non-licensed and cellular in licensed, they don't try and shoehorn cellular into Wi-Fi, although they're they starting do, yeah. to <laughs> looking yeah. at license assisted yes. access and so on. We'll see where we go with that. Be careful where you're meeting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, th I think it's, it seems unlikely in the next few years, a decade from now, it's too difficult yes. to call, I think. Yes. So so the the um, the unlicensed band, low powered network will, will function a little bit like Wi-Fi functions yeah. now. I think so. A and I think it will emerge in its own right, as it is already with Sigfox and others. Yes. Uh, and you know, we'll see exactly what technology dominates that. Obviously, I hope it's going to be waitlist. That's where I'm coming from. Yes. But, um, you know, the jury, well, let's I talk a bit, little bit about mm. wait, where, where's waitlist in the, in the uh, firmament at the moment? Yeah, so, so waitlist exists as the only open standard for wide area Internet of Things connectivity. Um, so companies like Sigfox and Laura and so on have essentially proprietary technologies. Um, Waitlist has always been there as a not-for-profit, open, democratic organization. And as such, it doesn't have a particular technology that it's trying to push. It's not been set up to further ultra-narrowband or anything else. It's simply there as a vehicle for its members to drive it in whatever direction it wants to go. And over time, that's driven us to, at the moment, two different standards. An ultra-narrowband standard we call Waitlist N, and a bi-directional standard that we call Waitlist P. Um, both of which are just getting to the stage now, software development kits and so on being available. Okay. So we're, we're some way behind the proprietary systems in terms of timing. But that's kind of inevitable with standards. Standards take longer because you need to get people together, reach agreement in an open democratic way, move forward as an ecosystem. Whereas if you're doing something proprietary, you're, you can just focus in your own little closed environment and make it happen and push it fast. So. That's no surprise that, that we're in that situation. Um, but I think that, you know, those proprietary systems, I think are increasingly seeing operators and others saying, we're nervous about a proprietary solution. It's a single source supply, it's potentially monopolistic, 
and it doesn't have any of the benefits of open standards of vibrant competition um, and the ability to draw in lots of different ideas to that. Yes, I wonder about that. I'm, I sometimes mm. wonder that they, they're rather comfortable with, uh, with the, the operators are rather comfortable with that model actually, mm. but well, we'll see. Yeah. They rather like a monopoly. Um, they like to be a monopoly themselves, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think they'd like a monopoly of the supply for anything that they, no, okay, that, that that they buy. That's a fair point. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, isn't there a danger that Weightless has missed the boat here? Because now you've got the GSMA going to mm. be coming out with, um, mm. with their standards, which seem to cover yeah. quite a bit of the range. Yeah. You've got big deployments of, um, of um, Sigfox mm. in, in France, say, mm. and, you know, there's quite a bit of LoRa activity as well. Is there going to be much no. room left? Because you know you've, you've even got France. Tel you've got the big telcos in France ad adopting pre-standard, um, you know, no. low-powered network technology. So, so, I think there's still plenty of room left. So, if we look at most of the predictions for Internet of Things, people talk about 50 billion devices or thereabouts. That seems to me eminently plausible. That's only 10 devices per person with a smartphone. That's not in any way unreasonable. And where are we at the moment? Te most 10% of that probably. So there's still 90% of the market to play for. In terms of network rollouts, there are Sigfox networks, but they're very small scale indeed. So here in the UK, our Kiva have rolled out into 10 cities, I think, but it's not anything like a, a sizable deployment. And I don't believe as yet they have that many customers. So I think it is still early days. Yes, Orange are, are, are going with LoRa in France, but that's one operator in one country. Uh, the fact actually that we haven't seen very large scale take up persuades me that in fact people are holding back waiting for something that's a bit more certain in this space so they can say that's going to be the winner we can back that and we can deploy behind that and if we look back to the early days of gsm or whatever we had whatever it was 90 operators in 30 countries or 40 countries all deploying within the space of a year or two in big scale that's what happens when people are certain and we haven't seen that yet William, thank you very much. Very interesting. You're welcome, Ian.